I'm going to be giving um, a talk this evening about um, classical Christian education. From the very outset of this talk, I have to say this is a very, very brief introduction into what classical Christian education is. Um, um, but what I will be doing uh, is posting uh, some resources that you can um, then look at to read more about this. And, and for those who are interested, I would strongly encourage you to do that because um, I'm just gonna touch on the very, very basics. It's probably gonna result in you having more questions than I can possibly answer in the time frame. Um, and so, um, you know, don't, um, if you're anything like me, uh, when you first approach the topic, uh, try not to feel overwhelmed. Um, just know that it, it really does require quite a course of study in order to get your head around what this is. And two things I want to note from the very start, and that is, the first is that this talk is not, and I have to be very clear about this, this talk is not an attack or a criticism of teachers. Um, my brother is a principal of a school, a school in Sydney. My sister-in-law has been a HSC teacher for 15 plus years. Um, and I know how hard teachers work. My, the, the issues that I'm gonna raise are about the system and the curriculum that's been developed um, over the, the last 70 to 80 years in education. The second thing um, that's important to note um, about this is that um, this is not new. This is what I'm gonna be discussing. This is not a new curriculum. Um, this is what you see in modern education is very much um, every time things don't work, um, sorry, what they do is they come out with a new way of dealing with the problem, put another Band-Aid on it and hope that that will fix the problem. Um, and that's, I think, been ongoing for um, a very, very, very long period of time. The, the, the major solution is to throw money at the problem and hope that that'll fix it. Um, Kevin Rudd decided to build school halls. Apparently that fixes education levels, I don't know. Um, but um, so I want you to bear those two things in mind. Um, this is not new. Uh, this is not a new curriculum that's, you know, some new fad. Uh, this is not Montessori or something like that. Um, and that again, this is not a criticism of teachers per se. Let's get started on what classical Christian education is. And I'm going to be talking about the history, its basis, uh, how it developed, um, how it then fell by the wayside and how we have the modern educational system that we have today. I wanna start off with giving, with providing some quotes about, um, from the early church fathers on education. The early church fathers surprisingly speak extensively about the importance of education um, in raising children, but possibly not from the perspective that you'd be thinking. St. Basil the Great, and I've got a, a number of just short quotes here, says, young people must be made to distinguish between helpful and injurious knowledge, keeping clearly in mind that, Christian, a, that a Christian's purpose in life. So like an athlete or, or the musician, they must bend every energy to one task, the winning of the heavenly crown. Um, that's unusual in, in and of itself, but it's indicative of the way the church fathers perceived the role of education, which we're going to delve into a bit um, more shortly. Um, but you notice from the restart, St. Basil sees education as being for the pursuit of the heavenly kingdom. I don't think you could look at today's modern educational system and consider that that's its, its objective. In fact, I think it you could quite clearly say some forms of Christian education, uh, predominantly by the, the Catholic Church, provide some sort of um, uh, Christian basis, which could work towards 
you know, the heavenly crown. But for the most part, modern education is not geared towards the heavenly crown at all. St. Basil also says, seek out with much care and thought a teacher who will be a safe guide to you in your manner of life. One who knows well how to lead such as are journeying towards God, a teacher who is rich in virtues and wise in the Holy Scriptures. Now, he's not just talking, he's not talking here about um, priests or um, uh, other members of the church who are teaching um, uh, theology, for example. Um, he is talking about education in its very broadest sense. And again, you see that education and the virtues and toward the journey towards the kingdom of God are inseparable. And then St. Cyprian says, let nothing be taught to children except those which nourish the soul and make one a better person. And I want you to keep that in mind as we go through the presentation. Um, I'm going to apologize. I will be moving fairly quickly through the slides. I do have quite a few, um, but it's just to give time at the end for any questions that people may have. So um, this is where I do a bit of a, a, a quiz and um, give you the opportunity to participate before I ramble on. Um, can anybody um, name any of the people there on the screen? I think Churchill. Winston Churchill, yep. Is that a, <clears throat> Lewis Carroll as well? Uh, Einstein and Shakespeare. Einstein and Shakespeare, yep. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Yep. The two greats, Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Um, there's two that are still not, haven't been named. Well, at the bottom right, below Winston Churchill, is Mary Curie. And the one that's sitting outside that's coloured is Copernicus. So why am I presenting these, uh, uh, the pictures of these people? What do they have in common? Well, the one thing they all have in common is that they were classically trained. Um, see, and, and Tolkien and Lewis um, are one of the few that, um, uh, they're kind of part of the, the la last generations to have received what we would consider to be a, a true classical Christian education until maybe the early 80s. Um, but all of them, including Einstein, Einstein didn't start off with just in, in the sciences. He received a classical education. He was very well read, right? Um, but he found his niche in science, obviously. Um, and the question I always ask, I've done this presentation a few times, is, can anybody, and if you look at all these people, these are what we call greats. Can we really name anybody in the last 50 years who we think genuinely can be called a great in the same league as these people? And this is just, it's, it, it, it's, it, it, it's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it. Um, but I would suggest that, uh, you'd probably be um, struggling to come up with a name. And I think it's simply because um, what we have here is a group of people who for them education was so much broader and deeper than what we get today. And it built them as people, not simply as a result in the HSC of, I don't know what the equivalent here in Queensland is, my apologies, of coming from Sydney and then Canberra, but your year 12 results. All right. So we're going to look at what, we're going to start off with what do we want to achieve through education? Because if we don't know what we want to achieve, then we can't determine how you go about achieving that, that purpose. So 
I want you. I want to present some views on the purpose of education um, from a classical perspective. And if I let me just go, actually let me just go back one slide. Um, if people want to unmute their mics, uh, what do you think education is? Its main objective is to achieve. Or for, or for those who are parents, what do you want the, the education of your children to achieve? To pass on knowledge. <laughs> pass, yeah, pass on knowledge, yep. Any other, sorry, I'm just trying to get to the chat box really quickly. To know how to think. Teaching people to, what was that, sorry? I didn't teaching, know. People, uh, teaching people to to know how to think you know not so much the the what of thinking but the the processes they're open yep yeah really i mean that's a that's a really important point um i also think um that uh education is about providing students with key skills and strategies to overcome problems that may occur during their lifetime as a result, you know, learning about not per se what what one plus one equals two, but more so what actually addition means in terms of it's a sum of this, a sum of that, giving a bigger sum and block of this. Yep. And uh, yes, absolutely, problem solving, um, and being able to break down a problem into its various parts to be able to work out how you develop an appropriate solution. Um, and someone said in the chat here, so that's a, that, I think that's a really good response, forming the mind and the soul of the child. Now, the top, now surveys have, surveys have been done. The top result regarding this question from parents across the board is to get into well-paying jobs. And survey after survey reinforces that response. So the way we view modern education is that it's your pathway to getting into university in order to get a, um, a degree that gets you into a well-paying job so that you can afford the large house, the Audi, and anything else that your neighbour, um, I suppose, um, has as well you don't get responses like critical thinking, problem solving, um, uh, or forming the mind and the soul. I'm gonna get back to this point about the forming the mind and the soul um, in just a moment. Um, the formation of the mind and the soul is completely absent from modern education. It doesn't even appear anymore. Um, and you will understand uh, shortly why. So in, I'm gonna provide you with some of the purposes for behind classical education and that is passing on the wisdom and the knowledge of one generation to another this is really important this is how we uh, develop as a civilization we we pass on our knowledge as we go along also the cultivation and nurturing of the whole person mind body and spirit um and somebody put that in the in the in the in the chat just a moment ago Treating somebody as a whole person, not simply trying to develop the mind, absent the, the spirit um, and the body. Now, C.S. Lewis says something very interesting, and he says the answer to this question um, in terms of uh, when we look at these types of things, the purpose of education, C.S. Lewis talked about classical education quite a bit. And he, one of his colleagues, Dorothy Sayers, who gave a speech about this in, in the 50s, uh, to, I think it was Harvard. And she said, we have basically uh, lost our path in regard to education. We have lost the essential foundations of education and we need to return to it. 
And C.S. Lewis wrote about this, and when he and what he said was, is that when we have lost our way, the quickest way forward is usually to go home. So go back. If you're lost, if you're if you've left home and you're on a journey, and you've lost your way, the quickest way to get back on course, assuming you don't have Google Maps, um, is to go back to the place you started and to head off in the right direction. And how do we get education back on track? Well, the answer is through classical Christian education. We go back to where education started from and the, ba and the, and the basis for all education for over a century. Uh, uh, sorry, for over a thousand years. So, what is classical education? Let me give you a few definitions. There, these definitions are from different people, and these are um, uh, people who are prominent in classical education in the in the US because the resurgence has been ongoing in the US for the last fifty years. Um, and so, these are some various definitions that might help you get your mind around what or how to. I suppose, understand classical education. So classical education is the authoritative, traditional and enduring form of education begun by the Greeks and the Romans, developed through history, now being renewed and recovered in the 21st century. Another way of viewing it, CE, uh, classical education, is a traditional approach to education employing the seven liberal arts. I'll get into what that means in a moment in order to cultivate men and women characterized by wisdom, virtue, and eloquence. Notice uh, the liberal arts, th there's, a, there's, a, there's a few issues with that definition. Firstly, liberal arts is not seen to be um, very appealing in today's modern education because, you know, how's it gonna get you a high paying job? Um, and I challenge anybody to go into a school and look at a curriculum where wisdom, virtue, or eloquence are even mentioned once. And so uh, it's important to understand the distinction uh, between modern education and classical education. I really like this definition. Um, this is from Andrew Kern at the Circe Institute. Um, Andrew is a wonderful speaker and he says, um, and he's very prominent in this area. He says, Christian classical education is the cultivation of wisdom and virtue by nourishing the soul on the true, the good and the beautiful by means of the several liberal arts so that in Christ, the student is better able to know, glorify and enjoy God. That's quite a mouthful, but he's trying to encapsulate a very broad concept into um, basically one sentence. Uh, but it does have all the essential elements. The cultivation of wisdom and virtue is one of the main objectives of classical education. It nourishes the soul, not simply the mind. An understanding of what is true and good and beautiful. And if we're looking at the true, the good and the beautiful, what is the greatest, what is the greatest truth? What is the greatest good and what is the, def the very definitive definition of beauty? It is Christ's. He is the fulfillment of all those things. And the seven liberal arts, and I'll break down the several liberal arts soon, um, but look at what Andrew Kern says. It's for the purposes of knowing and glorifying God. Again, you see no mention here in any of the definitions of it being to get ac academically a high score in order to get a good and high paying job. Andrew Kern, by the way, um, you can access, uh, if you go to the Searcy Institute, look him up on Google, um, uh, they run a lot of talks. Um, Andrew Kern is a convert to orthodoxy um, and uh, he's very passionate about classical education. So let's have a look at some of the purpose and objectives of classical education. Um, and let me just have a look here, sorry. Someone's got a question. Does a classical education necessarily include a Christian element? And if so, has that been the case over its long history? Okay, 
the the answer is um, that it started with well I'm, I'm going to touch on this actually so it's probably jumping ahead a little bit it started with the Greeks and the Romans so you would naturally realize that it's not going to have a Christian element I mean we're talking about the days of Aristotle and so forth so very early on it wouldn't but what happened was it was adopted by the Christian church east and west and it wasn't that they just added a Christian element to it it was that classical Christian education saw everything and teaches everything through the lens of Christ. You know, it's, it, it's not like the, the modern um, curriculum that we have where, you know, Christian schools effectively teach the, the Australian curriculum, add religion onto it, and that's our religious part done. Um, and, sorry, I know I'm jumping ahead, but as we're going to see, the sciences, um, the, the highest of all sciences in classical education was theology, the knowledge of God. But everything else was taught within the context of God and his creation and uh, his work of salvation. If you don't have that context, what does anything matter? I mean, why, why does it have, what does algebra have meaning if it's not within the context of God and his creation? I mean, really, who cares other than to build bridges? And it's, of course, it's got a purpose, but otherwise, just learning it for the sake of, sake of it, and let's face it, I don't know how many of you use algebra today after having left school. My apologies to the, to the, um, to the engineers out there. Um, I haven't looked at algebra in God knows how long. Um, but again, you can teach it out of context and it just means nothing. And that's what really it means to a lot of students today. Or you can teach it within the context of God and his creation and understand how it actually is, uh, displays and demonstrates the wisdom and the beauty of God. But we'll, I'll touch on this a bit more, uh, Lucy, as we go along. So let me just close the chat box. So some of the purpose and objectives. Um, to point a child towards something higher than themselves and to guide them to something higher. I find this particularly interesting because my view is that we live in a very narcissistic society and modern education, unfortunately, probably doesn't help. Um, in terms of it's all about me and me pleasing myself um, and how I can get the most for myself. And very much it's about the individual. Classical education, even from the days of Aristotle, was always about not yourself at all. It was about how you served the state. That was far more important than pleasing yourself. And so classical education points the child to something higher than themselves and guides them to something higher. And that of course is God. Another way of looking at this is to point children to what is high, noble and true in human life and to train them in the arts that help them to live well in community and to serve God. And again, if we look at historically, which we'll learn in a moment, what was the purpose of classical education? It was in order to raise a, t a total person in order that they may help to serve their society and to serve it well. And so they put community first to point them away from themselves, which is really the definition of uh, humility in a lot of ways. It's not about me. So what is the difference, what is different about classical education? Um, classical education doesn't offer a slight adjustment to the curriculum. Um, it's much more fundamental and inclusive 
uh, a, a more inclusive change in the paradigm. So the difference um, with classical education, it affects what is taught, how it's taught, how you govern and how you assess. Uh, this is really important. Uh, it even affects the vocabulary that we use to express the vision. Um, so this is, I, I, I said at the very beginning, classical education is not a new curriculum, but it's also not a few tweaks of the current curriculum. It's a, it's a very, very different way of teaching. Unfortunately, a, 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 pure, a, a true classical curriculum is impossible to achieve in, in a country like Australia because Australia is so heavily regulated in terms of its education. Um, you have to teach a curric a, a, the Australian curriculum and it's, um, it's, it's fairly strict in its approach. Um, so unfortunately in a country like ours, unlike in America, in a lot of states, they have a lot, it's far less regulated. So they can adopt um, a, a more classical curriculum. So what's different then, um, continuing on this theme, we, and this is from the Circe Institute from Andrew Kern. He says, we teach differently because we have a different perspective on the child. We don't believe that a child is a fortuitous blob of protoplasm waiting to be decomposed. We believe that she is nothing less than the divine image, an icon of the invisible God. She must not, therefore, be taught following techniques developed to instruct beasts. She must not be reduced to mere chemical responses to electrical stimuli. She must be taught personally in relationship. And if I had to sum that up, it's basically treat students like human beings and not commodities. Really in a nutshell, that's what Andrew's trying to say. He goes on to say, we teach different things because we have loftier goals for the child. We govern differently because we have a more serious perception of our task. We assess our work differently because we have higher standards. We conf confront the challenge of communication because we don't conform to the spirit of the age. So um, it, it, it takes quite a bit, if you're new to classical education, to really get around what it is, but understand that it is a completely, it's a very, very different approach to what we've been taught. And I can guarantee you, everybody here tonight has been taught using a modern um, uh, modern education. There have been aspects in our, in our education, some parts that still retain the classical um, remnant, but not a lot. Um, so, you know, we teach different things because we have different goals for the child. And we'll find out what this, those goals are, um, especially for modern education, because what your goal is for the child will determine how you teach them and what you teach them. So, some terminology um, for those who are not familiar with classical education and the terminology, it takes, it, it's good to know this. Paideia, Greek word, and it means education in the sense of the full enculturation of the child. So as we've said before, you develop the mind, the body, the soul, every aspect of the child is nurtured and developed. Um, education, that comes from the, the word edu educare, um, to, and it, it's a Latin word, to lead out, to lead the child out of themselves and towards something higher. That's what the word education means. And scholae, and, and that is leisurely learning, uninterrupted time. Um, that's, a, that's something we've really uh, compromised in modern education because the kids go from one class to the next class to the next class, go to recess, come back in, and we've got to get through the curriculum. And so you don't have much of an opportunity for leisurely learning, to, to be able to just think on what you've learned and let it sink in. Now, the trivium and the quadrivium. 
The trivium and the quadrivium are essential to understanding the basis for a classical education. The trivium being Latin for the three ways and the quadrivium being Latin for the four ways. Um, and the first thing to understand is a trivium and the trivium is grammar, logic and rhetoric. And um, the quadrivium is astronomy, arithmetic, music and geometry, the four. Now, I should say from the very start, um, the terminology that you're looking at, like grammar, rhetoric, astronomy, um, music, you can't interpret those in the way we interpret it in 2021. Music, for example, um, will be interpreted as guitar lessons, which is a musician historically was not somebody who played an instrument, by the way. A musician historically was somebody who actually studied the mathematics behind music. Astronomy is basically understood to be look through a telescope and look at the stars. But astronomy in the concept of the quadrivium pull, pulls in maths, physics, um, uh, to name one, the sciences, um, um, sorry, maths, of course, by itself, physics, science, um, but also understanding um, greater aspects like creation and the universe and its purpose. So when we look at these terms, we can't interpret them in the way we interpret them and, and think, wait a minute, they, aren't, they just taught the kids to play guitar and look through telescopes? Is that what they really did with the kids and the children? And that's not what they did. Um, it's because these terms, um, you have to unpack these terms to really understand the depth of each of them. And they basically pull in a lot of what we would, we would learn today. So grammar, logic and rhetoric, the three ways and the quadrivium, the four ways gives you the seven liberal arts. If, has anyone ever heard of the seven liberal arts? You may have, okay. Um, yes, so some people may have heard the term semi liberal arts. Um, liberal arts from the 80s has progressively just um, developed a really bad name because it's just seen to be quite useless. Um, universities have dropped a lot of their liberal arts subjects and even their whole departments because they don't make money. Um, and so uh, this is the several liberal arts and is what we call um, a classical education. Let's go have a go, uh, go through the history of it and um, to help you understand how it developed. So it started in the classical period, hence classical. Um, so the Greek and the Roman civilization. So around about 600 BC to 476 AD, um, the Greeks were the ones who really began the move to classical um, education. The Romans then when they um, uh, conquered, um, they took a lot from the Greeks. And one of the things they really loved about the Greeks was their form of education. And they actually got the Greeks to teach them. Um, and so the Romans adopted it, but then they added to it. And Historically, there was a sustained emphasis on the study of grammar, literature, logic, and rhetoric. And one thing I should say, and let me just go back a slide. If the one thing I would add to this is you've got the trivium, quadrivium, the seven liberal arts, but the thing that also characterizes a classical education is the great books. Um, in terms of reading of the, the classical literature. That's always been a fundamental part of a classical education. Then we move on into the Middle Ages between 500 and 1460 AD, the Greek and the Roman approach was analyzed and it was put into a systematic and more consi uh, a consistent form and a curriculum. So it was basically put into a curriculum as such. Up until this point, the Greeks and the Romans didn't have a formal curriculum. It was just the way they, they taught. 
and you would go under the tutelage of a of a um, uh, of a master, and you would be taught, um, and that's how it went. But in the Middle Ages, it, it started to develop. Uh, they started to develop uh, uh, it in a more consistent and form formulaic way, um, and that developed into a curriculum, and that ended up with the curriculum of the trivium. Um, and the quadrivium, as we've already just discussed. Then you had the Dark Ages and the Renaissance. Um, and in the little, late Middle Ages, Dark Ages, learning began to decline. So up until this point, learning was growing quite rapidly um, and people were becoming more educated. But then through the Dark Ages, learning begins to decline. Um, and it's not until you get to the Renaissance and the Reformation that you have a return to the learning of the past, particularly the study of Greek and Roman authors in their original languages of Greek and Latin. And that's another aspect. You have the, the several liberal arts, the great books, but also the teaching of Greek and Latin. And um, that's really important because if you're going to read classical literature, it is always better to read in the original language because any translation is always a destruction. You always lose something in, tran in translation. And so in order to read uh, Aristotle or the Odyssey or the Iliad or any of that great literature, uh, they would go back, they would learn the language and read the original source. Now, the Enlightenment. I mean, I'm using these terms because this is what, you know, history books will use. We know that the Dark Ages were not dark and the Enlightenment was not, well, not from a Christian perspective, not necessarily an Enlightenment. Um, science is not the be all and end all, but you, you get with the development of science, you get a departure from the authority of scripture and the church to the power of man's native intellect. We, just, we, we move into a, an, an era of science becoming the new God and we can answer everything through science. So we no longer need the scriptures. We no, no longer need the church for that matter to be able to interpret and understand these things or provide the context for it. So there is a move to, to study and understand the world without reference to biblical teaching or authority. Why? Because we have science and science can, can tell us how it all happened. So therefore, that is what we'll base it on. And also science is evidence-based apparently. So, you know, you, um, it's more reliable than the Bible from a scientific perspective. And so, um, with this departure uh, from scripture and the, and, and the church, um, we have um, uh, we have a move, we have a dramatic shift in the way education starts to be developed. It's now moving away, beginning to move away from its original Greco-Roman um, foundation. Then the the Christian church adopted it, classical education. And the Christian church adopted the classical model and theology, remember we talked about the quadrivium. Um, theology became the queen of the sciences. Because if you think about it, the, there is no greater study than the study of God. Everything else pales in comparison um, to no, trying to um, uh, grasp the essential elements of, you know, God, who he is and what he does and, and all those sorts of questions that we have um, and that students will have. And, but what's interesting is that the Christian, although the Christian church adopted classical Christian education, it continued to study non-Christian classical authors of the past, like Aristotle. And for those of you uh, who may have read some uh, of the Church Fathers, you will see that they actually quote quite a bit 
um, some of the, the early philosophers, um, the Cappadocian fathers received what would be considered to be um, a, a classical education. Very well read, all of them. The 19th and the 20th century. Um, well, before I get into that, any questions so far? I mean, I, I'm racing through this. This, you know, I'm just, uh, I can't. <laughs> um, it's, it's good, making sense. Okay, so now we're going to move into the, the 20th century because this is where it gets really important. In the 1800s, classical education um, was the dominant approach to education, the trivium and the quadrivium. But by 1950, there was a dramatic shift to what was called a progressive model of education, what we call modern education. Now, I want you to notice something. We're talking about the 1950s. It's 2021. It's not that long ago. So progressive modern education is less than 100 years old. And so what happened was, and uh, again, I'm, I can only touch on the very basics here. If you're interested, there are some really good books on this. Two people in particular, Horace Mann and John Dewey, emphasized learning by doing and rejected many traditional methods of education. For them, the purpose of modern education was to train citizens for, the gro for growing industrialization. Now, this makes some sense, especially after World War II, where you had um, um, massive growth in economies and industries just boomed after you know, um, World War II, especially. Um, and so for Horace Mann and John Dewey, they saw, um, education as simply to train people for jobs because you have industry that's growing you need the people the manpower to do it and so therefore we have to teach them what they need to know in order to do the job very different from molding the person mind body and soul in order to as saint basil said to achieve the kingdom of heaven and to serve their community, for example. Progressive modern education, these are some of the things that they believed and taught, um, uh, especially um, John Dewey. They believed that they were introducing a superior method of teaching. They were preparing students for life in the modern, quickly changing post-war world. So example, under progressive education, classical languages were dropped, I mean, what good is Latin in a factory drilling widgets? There's no need for it. Um, whole language approach to reading was adopted. Um, so, you know, instead of learning how a word is constituted, um, you just learn the whole word. If you can learn to say the whole word, that's it, you're done. Don't worry about understanding the basis for how the word is put together. Self-expression without fault finding. This is really interesting. So um, let the student express themselves in whatever they, way they want and never tell them that they're wrong. And then um, individualistic creative writing. And again, um, not teaching them the skills of good writing, but let them write whatever they want and always tell them that it's great. Um, I taught first year law students um, at the University of Sydney. These were all students who achieved above 99 in the HSC. Um, and I cannot tell you the number of times I read an assignment where they could not put a sentence together. So obviously they were very good at the sciences, which is how I suspect they got their high marks, but completely neglected to be able to write and express themselves. Um, reminds, sorry, reminds me of my art class, self-expression without fault finding. Yes, I painted a terrible mess 
and got an A. I knew I didn't deserve it, but apparently standards for good art don't exist. Yes. And can I tell you, um, look, some of you are going to disagree with me on this. That's fine. I, I'll, but I, I'll just put it out there. It, it's a little bit like what people call modern art. Um, I saw a documentary recently. My wife and I saw a documentary on a girl was, she was how old? She was four, maybe four. And she was throwing paint, throwing paint on a canvas. And she was selling these paintings. People were buying them, paying hundreds of thousands of dollars and saying how great the artwork was. Um, and this is considered to be, now, you know, artists of old, the great artists, or even take musical composers, they all learned by imitation from the greats and then they developed their own kind of style. But they learned by imitation, they studied the greats. They didn't just, they weren't just told, just take a, a canvas and do it if you like and it'll be fantastic. There's such a thing as bad art. And there's plenty of bad music, but I'm just showing my age. But, but you know, now modern, uh, modern education and especially John Dewey, it, I mean, the, the, the thing with fault, no fault finding and fault, fault finding and letting them be creative is simply to ease their transition through education to make it as smooth as possible, just to get them into the factory into the workforce. So we're not concerned about their personal growth. We're just concerned about the economy. Now, there's some really interesting things about modern education. Philosophical relativism. No universal truths or moral standards. Now, you look at modern education today. Um, there is no such thing as truth, and there are no moral, sta moral standards. Truth is whatever the individual believes it to be. Philosophical skepticism, which is nothing can be known with certainty. Nothing can be known with certainty. Apparently, even gender. Um, uh, or as I heard, um, in America, just in the last couple of days, they've started instead of, <laughs> they've started using the term birthing persons, i.e. that's what a mother is. These are politicians that are using this term. This, is on, this has only just happened in the last few days. This is how ridiculous um, it's become, but nevertheless, um, nothing can be known with any certainty. Nothing can be known with any certainty. Um, then people are continually in a state of um, uncertainty because you can't ever know it. And then the third thing is, uh, and John Dewey was very big on this, everyone determines his own truth and his own morality as, as we've touched on before. Something I should mention about John Dewey. John Dewey was, um, uh, was a, a, a strong atheist a very, very strong believer in evolution. But he signed a document in the 1930s, which it was a group of people who stated a whole lot of scientific facts that they believed were, were true. Um, and one of the things he, he, he spelled out, he, he um, signed his name to was, is that the, the human being does not have a soul. That's irrational. And it can't be proved by science. And of course, if you can't prove something by science, it obviously doesn't exist. And um, and it, why am I why am I mentioning this? And by the way, there's a whole list of them. Um, why am I mentioning this? It's because this these are the people who strongly influence modern education that we have today. That then help, helps us to understand why, why we have the educational system that we have today and what its purpose is. If you, do, if you view the student in one, one way, you'll get, you will then um, teach them a certain way. 
if they, if they don't have a soul, then they're just a blob of atoms. And they're there just for uh, a particular purpose. If they're made in the image and the likeness of God, that's a different matter altogether. So progressive modern education, as I've mentioned before, it, it's, um, it's an experiment in education that is less than 100 years old and it's flagging, it's, it's failing. The classical experiment is over a thousand years old and it's reviving and it has given us the greats in history that have contributed to society and have made huge um, contributions to how we live um, and how we even understand ourselves today. So how are students in progressive modern education performing in Australia? And this is just purely on an academic scale. So the UN runs a report on 41 countries every year across a range of different areas and it assesses the countries on how well they do. Australia is one of those countries. In, out of the 41 countries, where do you think Australia ranks education-wise? If you had to hazard a guess, where do you think Australia sits? Somewhere near the bottom. <laughs> Somewhere near the bottom. Yes. Anyone want to be more specific? Anyone want to guess? Mum reckons around 30s. Maybe 32. Okay. So we rank 39, 39th out of 41 countries, right? So, um, so let me show you the next slide. This is, I'm sorry, this is the best I could do without distorting the image. Um, it's, um, and I'll just minimize mine. So quality of education, if you scroll down to Australia, um, no, we are not Austria, as everyone thinks we are, 39th for quality of education. Now, Turkey and Romania are the only two countries that sit below us. We happen to think that we have a very good education system. And again, this is not, um, I'm not saying that we have, you know, have a terrible education system, but it's probably not performing anywhere near as well as we think it is. Um, and this is why governments, state and territory governments, even the Commonwealth government keep, keep throwing money at, at the problem, trying to improve results. Um, so by the way, this, this is done every four years. Um, interestingly, not surprising, uh, Finland came out number one. Finland has been number one thereabouts for the last 15 years. Um, I was speaking to somebody at church today. Finland's got a very different system. You find very, very few private schools in Finland, but you have majority of the schools in Finland are public schools. Doesn't matter which public school you go to, your, ch ch your child will get exactly the same level of education as the kid in the next high school, in the next public school, sorry. Not only that, all their teachers must have master's degrees at a sufficient level. Teachers in Finland are some of the highest paid occupation, but they're also some of the smartest. And I, I question, uh, you know, um, for a long time, um, the entry mark for teaching has been very low. Why do we want to basically lower the standard for entry into teaching? We should be aiming for the best and the brightest. And yet that's not how we do it. Interestingly enough too, Finland does not give homework. Um, and for that reason alone, I, I you know, almost want to move to Finland. Um, because it'll save me years of grief that's coming up. But, um, but there's something um, 
there's something else to consider. And we know, especially in maths and science, that, um, that you know, Australia has been lagging behind for quite a while. Um, and the Asian countries are doing very well. And, uh, you know, in, in the maths and sciences, and they're, ex you know, they're, they're, they're surpassing us. But we're talking about overall quality of education. And when they, when the UN assess it, they don't just assess it based on the marks that the children get, they assess it holistically in terms of the quality of the, the teaching they get, um, the experience that the children have. Children in Finland love going to school generally and are far more enthusiastic about teaching. I have to say, if you speak to a lot of teachers today, they're likely to tell you that there's just a lack of interest in learning in Australian schools. They just don't enjoy it. Classical education is, one of its aims is to actually encourage the child to love learning. Because you give them the tools to learn, the grammar, logic and rhetoric are the basis for learning. And then they can then go on to master and be adept at anything. Um, and I was, I, I was saying, I was talking to um, some people at church today um, about um, this wonderful um, uh, YouTube video that there is on um, a a very old gentleman in his eighties who was the longest. Um, serving pilot for United Airlines in the US. Um, when he went to interview for the job, um, he turned up and he had, um, the, the gentleman who was interviewing him said, um, why are you here? And he looked at him and he said, well, I'm applying for a job as a pilot. And he said, yes, but you've got an English major. I've got a whole lot of guys here who are, coming from technical schools, aeronautical technical schools, and you're coming to me with an English major. He said, give me one reason why I should even consider you. He said, well, a classical education, a liberal arts education has given me the ability to think critically and to analyze, to problem solve, and to be able to implement a solution and to be able to adapt that solution depending on the circumstances. And he said, I think those skills might be useful in flying a plane. He went on to be the longest serving pilot for United Airlines. So much so they originally had a rule, which was if you, as a pilot, if you ended up having to wear glasses like me, you had to retire. You could no longer fly they changed the rule just to keep him flying. And today you have United Airlines pilots who can now wear glasses and fly planes, but they adapted it. And he was one of their best pilots. And it's because he wasn't trained for a job. He was trained with the skills to be able to learn and to then be able to apply it to any particular area that he found himself in. So, um, as I said um, already, that Australia was 39th out of the 41. Australia is um, falling behind in reading, writing, and arithmetic, the most basic elements we would think. Um, and you can see this because um, the states and territories continue to pour money into these three areas and, and they just can't make any grounds in terms of improvement. Um, that plan is. Um, uh, is not an improvement. And that plan is a means of trying to um, uh, measure students against other students and, and schools against schools. Um, but that plan has not resulted in any increase or improvement. Uh, in fact, what it's done is it's put pressure on teachers who are already pressed for time to have to invest time in preparing the kids for nap plan when they should be teaching. Um, 
and 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 I mean that that's just been um, by the way uh, something you'll find very interesting standardized testing um, one thing I hate more than anything else is multiple choice I mean really when you have to put the, the answer in front of the student and hope that they pick it you give them four answers they've got one out of four All right standardized testing the man who invented standardized testing is quoted as saying these methods are too crude and should not be used he himself denounced standardized testing and yet that's what we do across the board that's what nut plan does um, and I can tell you, first and foremost, as a parent, because I have a right to opt out of whether my child does a NAP plan, my, my daughter will not be doing that plan. I mean, I, I just think it's an absolute waste of her time. Um, but, um, but this is, assessment is a different topic altogether and it's, it's, a, it's a problematic one, um, but we are stuck with uh, an assessment regime that you really can't change much of. In under the Australian curriculum. So, recovering, recovering classical education. The Greeks passed down their concept of paideia or arets. Um, and education for them was the making of a man, not the training of a man to do things, vocational training. You made the person and then they applied themselves to whatever it was that they were doing. I'll just move. Dorothy says, if um, uh, I mentioned her before and she speaks about, she spoke about, and she wrote an essay called The Lost Souls of Learning. And she talked about how the trivium subjects are not really subjects, but are a means or method of handling and learning subjects, kind of like a master art, like a, a tool. For example, if you have an apprentice who's learning to become a carpenter, the first thing the apprentice must learn to do is use the tools before he can go and do any work. If he doesn't know how to use a, a saw, he's not going to be much good, is he? Um, um, and so the grammar, logic and rhetoric are the means by which they learn everything else. They're the tools of learning. So, and I should just clarify how this works. Very generally, because Dorothy Sayers explained it. Each trivium art is a tool that once mastered can be applied to fashion all varieties of wood. So once you have those tools in your hands, once you've taught them those things, they can apply themselves to any number of subjects. So the trivium, and because you might be wondering how it actually fits together, um, grammar, logic and rhetoric are the central disciplines. Grammar is what we apply, what's applied at the primary stage um, from our oh, prep, it's called here in, in Queensland, to year six. So every subject has its own grammar. When we talk about grammar, I know everyone just thinks about where do I put the semicolon and do I have to put an apostrophe? No, no, no. Grammar is far broader than that. And in classical education, it, it has a, every subject has, has its grammar, geography, history, science it all ha they all have their own grammar and so the the students are there while when they're young and they really really want to learn they just love collecting facts then we fill their minds with facts um we teach them um using song and um and 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 rhyme um timelines all these sorts of things means by which they can memorize then logic, logic is, comes in roughly say year seven to nine. And that's where you've got students who just want to argue. Okay, no problem. If they want to argue, let them argue. But we will teach them how to argue correctly and soundly and how to be able to engage in, in an argument um, or in a debate. Um, and to be able to recognize flaws in your opponent's argument. 
or when they're introducing something new that has no relevance and how to be able to deal with that. And then you have rhetoric. And that's really the art of eloquent speech and writing. So they're kind of out of that argumentative phase somewhat. And now they want to express themselves. And this is where rhetoric. Now, by the way, this is this is a very, I, I, it's not as if it's kind of this rigid in terms of a classical education. Grammar, logic and rhetoric kind of flow all the way through. But if you're looking at the emphasis at the different age groups, you use the child's natural um, uh, development in order to teach them what they need to at that time. So when they're young and they want lots of facts and they love learning news, then you give them grammar. When they want to argue, then we teach them logic. When they want to express themselves, then you have rhetoric. Trivium and the quadrivium, it's mastery of language leads to the mastery of the sciences. And this is really important because if you have grammar, logic and rhetoric, then you can then go on to master the sciences like the quadrivium, astronomy, for example, and music um, in terms of the way they were entailed in classical education. But you're giving the child and the student, sorry, I should say, the skills to go on as that United Airlines um, pilot did, to go into any area and to be able to quickly learn what they need to and to do well at it. So the traits of classical education, um, uh, I've touched on this before, Latin and Greek. Why Latin and Greek? Because Latin constitutes almost 70% of the English language. Uh, Greek is about another 20 to 30% of the English language. To give you um, um, an example, um, in Latin, the word porta is responsible for 15 English words. Important, port, portical. Um, so if you understand, the, if you understand Latin, um, you then have a much better understanding and a better grasp of the English language, but also it allows the student to read the original texts for the classical books. Interconnectivity of subjects. This is really, um, we teach in high schools, especially you have, they go to maths class, they go to science, they go to um, history and they're separate and distinct. Classical education brings them all together. It's not as if you don't have separate subjects, but uh, a history class will bring in maths and science into it. And it will pull it all together so you get a holistic whole. The, 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 the world we live in is not segregated parts. It's an integrated whole. And that's how um, we should approach the subjects. To display to the students the interconnectivity of each, all the subjects. And the great books. Um, the Odyssey, the Iliad, um, Aesop's Fables, if you've ever read that. Um, and just the great literature that has stood the test of time. And yes, there is such a thing as good literature. Um, uh, you know, um, The Lord of the Rings, for example, if you've ever actually sat down and read it, um, it is a book, just in case, um, before it became the movies, um, great literature. Um, and these are books, um, whereas you wouldn't put something as poor as Fifty Shades of Grey within that category of books, right? It's, it's, it's trash reading. So um, these are the books that not only are they going to, it's not, it's not about them just enjoying the reading, but they're going to learn from it. You know, if you look at the characters in something like um, The Lord of the Rings, each one of them touches on a various human aspect and there's a lot to, there's a lot to know it's a very there's, there's so many layers in that book um so the great books um 
I once I was at work talking about education to a, a friend of mine, a colleague at work. She had three kids at school and I just asked her, so what are your kids reading at the moment? And um, what's on their, what's on their book reading lists? And she said, I don't know, actually. I'll, I'll ask them. She went home, she came back the next day and she said to me, so I asked my kids about their reading lists and they laughed. And she said, what's so funny? She said, mom, we don't have a reading list. An education where you don't have, a, you don't have some set readings and you don't encourage your, your students to read is not, I don't even think is worse than education. Um, and it's very disappointing. Now, just a, a few more things and I am gonna finish. Um, the role of parents. Classical education um, is, is not the kind of education where parents can drop their kids off to school at 8.30 in the morning, pick them up at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon and just you know, allow the school to do its job. Um, parents are an integral part of classical education. And, um, and that's really important because the home also must um, encourage and create an atmosphere which helps them to continue their learning even at home. So the parents play a critical role in the education of their child. Remember, we we're talking about the church fathers at the beginning. One thing that's interesting is all that the church fathers speak about consistently is the role of education, sorry, the responsibility of education is, the, is to the parents. What modern education has done is it has allowed us to delegate that out to the state or to other denominations. We've handed over responsibility. It's not my problem, it's a teacher's problem. I pay them school fees and they teach my child. It's our job in front of God to educate our children. Also, it has to be Christ-focused. Everything has to be taught through the lens of Christ and it has to be for the development of Christian character and virtue. It doesn't matter if a child excels and gets 99 and is able to top all their exams. And let's just say that they get into um, uh, a great university and they're able to graduate and get into a very high paying job. Is that really going to be worth anything if they've learned nothing about honesty or integrity or how to be a Christian or humility or love. Um, again, for St. Basil, what was the aim? The kingdom of heaven. So the US has been, and this is the last, last one, um, the US has been in a boom period of revival for Christian education for the last, since the 1980s, we started with Doug Wilson. So some of you might be wondering, okay, that all sounds really nice, but do the kids actually do academically well? Uh, because we still, you know, we still want them to get out there and get good jobs um, and to be able to survive. Um, so, Students from classical schools in the US consistently perform and score in the top 10 to 15% of the SATs, which is their like their HSC equivalent, the year 12. Um, they often um, are a significant proportion of the National Merit Scholars. Um, they're extremely competitive um, uh, uh, against their uh, against all the other forms of education and many of them get scholarships to some of the best the very best universities um, and they've got a so in the US at the moment it'd be bordering on 450 to 500 classical schools um, a lot of them are predominantly are classical what we call classical Christian schools some are what we even call classical orthodox schools um, they're from an orthodox perspective but there are also what's called classical charter schools which are public schools in the us so they're taxpayer funded schools that are using a classical curriculum and that's that's a growing area 
Um, and they, their students are already excelling past their peers in regular public school. So as I said, when I put this slide together, it was about 350, it's changed. Um, and they're growing at about 10 to 20% a year. Um, there's a lot of schools that are not part of the Association of Classical Christian Schools um, in the US. So there are more out there than is reported. Um, there's also, I should say, a huge homeschooling um, network in the US, massive homeschooling. And the amount of resources now is, is incredible. A lot of them are, are, are adopting classical curriculums. Um, far, far easier when you're at home and you don't have, you know, um, you don't have a school telling you what your, your child can or can't learn. Um, I've touched on that. Um, this is just a, a, a graph of, um, for reading, math and writing, you can see that the, um, these are the uh, um, Association of Classical Christian Schools. Um, their results in reading, math and writing against the nation, the rest of the US, um, and they excel and uh, surpass their, um, their, uh, their peers. Again, that's so um, the, I should say that when I, um, this, this is an old slide, um, I was given, uh, I was working on this project uh, in Canberra before I moved to Brisbane. Um, and uh, the, the notion of uh, a, a classical orthodox school, we, as far as I'm aware, there are only four schools in Australia that run a classical curriculum. One of them is here in Queensland. It's called St. Philomena's. It's a, it's, a, it's a Catholic school in, I think it's Peaks Ridge. Sorry, I'm fairly new to Brisbane. So maybe I've got that suburb wrong. Um, St. Philomena's. Um, and um, whereas in the, in the US, they're bordering on, you know, five, 500 and more. Um, but uh, in Australia, it's a very small number. We are heavily regulated by the Australian um, education, uh, sorry, by the Australian curriculum. And that's why a lot of schools don't venture into it because it means um, you have to do a lot of work to adapt, to try and adapt the curriculum. But um, the, the project that I was working on was to look at what it would, what it would take basically to get a school up and running. Um, and I know a lot of parents are, um, are looking for an alternative. And for, uh, I know um, for myself as a parent, I would much prefer my child to be in, an, in, a, in, a, in a classical school, but in a, in a classical orthodox school. So one that is teaching from an orthodox perspective. Um, and one that is going to um, nourish the soul, body, mind, spirit of the child. Not just, um, now I should say in Sydney and Melbourne, there are a lot of what you call orthodox schools. They are just regular schools with regular curriculums. Uh, they're not classical in any way. Um, and St. Sava's, the newest college, the Serbian Orthodox um, opened up a new school this year called St. Sava's. It's just down the road from the Coptic College uh, that my brother was the deputy principal at for about 13 years. Um, they are running, they, they're K to two and they are using as classical a curriculum as possible. But it is a lot of work, uh, but having said that, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, we've got contacts in the US who, um, who are, um, who are heavily involved in classical education and who are able to assist. And some of them are actually working on, they, well, um, um, uh, Andrew Smith, um, um, he, his whole job is to set up um, what's called classical orthodox schools. He's a convert to orthodoxy and he, he just goes, he helps two, I think two to three schools a year get set up. Um, and so, you know, some food for thought would be, you know, is this something that we could um, 
uh, consider. Um, homeschooling is not for everybody for various reasons. Um, to, both parents may have to uh, work um, or they may not have a desire to teach. You know, a, te a teacher needs to love what they do. It's really important. Um, and so um, the school is probably, a school is still the, the most preferred option for most people. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's possibly some opportunities here um, with the right enthusiasm um, to be able to, um, to consider uh, what we would call a classical Orthodox school. God bless you all. Have a blessed week. Nice to see you and uh, I hope to see you soon. God bless.